What's up, H-Town? Welcome to the Believe in Astros podcast, your home for all things Astros, with your hosts, sports writer Jeff Balky and Astros broadcaster and former third baseman Jeff Blob. Now, here's Balky and Blubber. What is up, Astros fans? Welcome to episode 44 of the Believe in Astros podcast on the Believe Podcasting Network. I'm Jeff Balgi, my partner fresh off what appeared to be a jam-packed fan fest. Jeff Blum, we're going to discuss that and more things here in a moment. You can find us on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, and of course YouTube. Be sure to like and subscribe to keep up with us and give us a follow on Twitter. We're at Believe in Astros. You can find me at Jeff Balgi and Blummer at Blummer27. Pretty much on any social network you choose. Uh, um, hell, I'm that's my name on Spotify. Um, so <laughs> you, you can find me anywhere. Um, which I don't know if that's such a good thing in the world today, but <laughs> you know, trans, radical transparency. Um, thanks for everyone who's uh, given us five stars and, and left reviews on Apple. You guys are the best. If you haven't and feel we are worthy, please follow suit. Obviously, send us your comments, questions. We love seeing all your comments and read them all. For example, should Billy Wagner be in the Hall of Fame and why are you wrong for saying no? <laughs> that's a two-parter. <laughs> that's a little two-part You're question. You're not wrong. Uh, no, I think that's, that's an exa- easy one to answer. It's a pretty easy one to answer, I feel like. And so that's, yeah. you know... That's, you know, what you're wrong, whatever the question, whatever the answer to that one is, you're absolutely incorrect. So uh, <clears throat> we did have a question from a listener today. I'm going to I'm going to talk about that in a minute nice. as well. When we get into the uh, want to get into I do need to, a word for our sponsor here. Um, and I'm trying to find it. This is how this is my life right now. I'm so disorganized. Uh, I think it's this one. Let's let's read it and see what happens. What's the worst that could happen? Um, here we go. <laughs> Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season. Everything from the NFL playoffs to pro and college basketball, UFC, MMA, and more. And man, what happened to the Cowboys? That look, Woo. man. I'm, this is not a Cowboy podcast or a football podcast, but that was one of the worst final series of any games I've Dear ever God. seen in my entire life. I mean. And they with a weird lineup at the end, and then they just threw one for eight Dude. yards, and the game was over. Like you spend that much time <laughs> setting that play up to have it just implode in that just, kind of dramatic fashion. Just, yeah, you deserve I all mean, the criticism. I was honestly laughing my ass off. It was so funny. Like you take a time. Everybody, st- they. I mean, they took a time out because they weren't sure what to do against this formation, and then mm-hmm. well. The answer is nothing because something's going to happen. Anyway, well, it was great. Well, the decision was let's blow up Ezekiel Elliott and then oh my create God. create a five yard pass mean, when they need to what? get in the end that, zone. He just got <laughs> pancaked. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like it, to put ten grand down on the fact that Ezekiel Elliott will finish the game on his back. Yeah, exactly. No doubt. Oh my God, that's a good one. That, I'd like to see some odds on that one. <laughs> you always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends at Bet Online with live betting options, free contests, live scores for almost any sport or game imaginable. Uh, by the way, I did see we were talking about this last time. I said, do they think they have slap fest betting? There Ooh. is slap fest. I saw one where it was these no two way. women slapping oh, no. each other, and it was like a fully professionally produced. It looked like professional wrestling or something. They had judges. They had a time limit. And this one woman smacked this woman, and she just kind of went, you know, shook it off. <clears throat> and, then the, no, and then the other woman hit the woman, and she just out. She just hit the ground. She, like, tried to stand up and, like, did a somersault because she was – I mean, what? What is the I point? Don't know. This, I don't know. People have too way too much time on their yeah, hands. I just had a phrase this. pop into my head that I cannot say out loud, but man, <laughs> you can say for I don't know. Air. We'll yeah. we'll discuss it later. Bet online is truly the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite leagues and events. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to join and receive a fifty percent welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure you use, make sure to use promo code believe B L E A V to receive your rewards. <clears throat> Betonline.ag where the game starts. So getting off of the slap fest um, <laughs> for a moment, uh, let's talk about a different fest, fan fest. So Ooh. I saw a bunch of your videos that you reposted of people uh, selfieing with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, you seem like a very popular gentleman at uh, fan fest. Oh. I was, I was unable to attend. I had some responsibilities with the in-laws, um, but 
Uh, it did look like a good time. How, what, what was your impression? It was an absolute blast. Uh, you, you know, you have an idea of what you're getting yourself into sometimes. And, mm-hmm. you know, this has been an abbreviated off season. We've talked about yeah. that plenty for some of these guys. Yeah. And, you know, I went out on the caravan. There was a decent response on that. But going into FanFest, you just expect to show up. There's going to be there's going to be a decent crowd. You're going to sign some autographs, take some pictures. But as I'm rolling into the ballpark, I am, I am I'm witnessing – all of the regular game day parking lots full. And I'm going, man, there's no game today. It's just fan fest. We're just going to cruise around, have a good time, reminisce about how great 2022 was and look forward to the new season. And I get into the ballpark and it, the concourses are slammed. I mm. could barely get to the AT&T little booth that we were taking pictures at. There was a line. I stood there for an hour and a half with TK and Julia for about maybe 30 minutes. And then Mike Stanton showed up and it was Mike Stanton and I, and we, we took pictures for a legit hour. It was nonstop. So it was incredible to do that. And then I had the, I don't know how I lucked out, but I got to go on the field and do the fan forum and I got to do two sessions of that. This is, this is probably the best part. Because I had Lance McCullers Jr. and Jeremy Pena in the first. Both great dudes. <laughs> Man, awesome. Both, both great conversations. Both having you know major impacts on postseason, yeah. regular season. That went extremely well. And then following that, I had Alex Bregman and Jose Altuve. And Whoa. That, that was a lot of fun, too. But you know, being able to communicate with these guys and put them on that stage and, and give them you know, all the glory they deserve for everything they've done this season has been amazing. And just a broadcaster note, since we're on this podcast, Bill Brown is being inducted into the Astros Hall of Fame. Yes, I couldn't be more proud of him and happy for him and Diane. Billy Dorn's going in with him. So it's, it's just amazing to see, you know, some of these stick around long enough to see these things happen. So it's been a lot of fun to be in the golden era of baseball and then watch one of your uh, mentors, I guess, and good friends get inducted into the hall of fame. So it was a good weekend. Yeah, that's that. uh, Yeah. Just, it sounds like an amazing weekend. Just a moment to set for Bill Brown. One of the best guys, uh, absolutely spectacular broadcaster. There are a few guys in Houston having grown up here that, that are to me, the voice of Houston sports, yeah. Um, to me, Bill Brown, even more so than Milo Hamilton, for example, uh, or Gene Elston, <clears throat> you know, or many of these guys going back for me, it was Gene Peterson with the Rockets, uh, Bill Brown and Bill Worrell who covered both, yeah, Bill uh, you Worrell know, Astros, a big one too. and, 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 you know, the Bill, uh, you know, just Brown though, my goodness, what a resume, just a tremendous. I just such a. a I loved how even keeled he was. Uh, I loved how he was matter of fact in his approach, um, and I loved the fact that he he had a lot of different you know uh, on air partners, and he was just great with them. <laughs> you know, he was great with them. Yep. He handled everyone the same. Um, he was the perfect straight man. Um, oh and man, just a, was he? Just, just so good. I mean, the the stuff he did with Jim Deshays, in particular, when he would have the, in those er, in that era, uh, you know, and uh, and just great dude. I, I met him once. Uh, oh man, it's just super super nice. Um, of course, I've I've met Bill Worrell on many occasions. I I love him to death. He's one of the best guys ever. So the two, you know, those are two of my all time favorites, and just so well deserved. <laughs> No, yeah. Uh, Bill Brown was the soundtrack of my Astros career. So, Mm -hmm. you know, every highlight I've had, Bill Brown's been on top of it. And uh, then moving into the booth and being able to learn how to broadcast with and around Bill Brown was amazing. And uh, some of the information he imparted on me and some of the techniques and, you know, understanding cadence and inflections and timing, uh, you know, all that was learned from Bill Brown. And then you (laughs) add the humanity on top of it. And he's one of the purest humans I've ever met in my life. He has never said a derogatory thing about anybody that I know. And uh, he he was just a lot of fun. I've got great Bill Brown stories and great memories with him. But now to watch him go in, I can't wait for Legends Weekend. Right. Because Billy Dorn's another guy that oh, I grew up watching in uh, the Ameri- or the National League West, and he's going in, and then Bill Brown on top of it. So you may not hear me talk about too much Astros current baseball because I'm going to be living in you know Astros past <laughs> fantasy land with both those guys. Dude, Billy Doran, 
He's a maniac. Yeah. What a great, but it, this, it, just a huge <laughs> fan favorite back in the day. Tremendous I mean, just fan a favorite. huge yeah. fan favorite back in the day when he was playing for the Astros. Uh, I know several people who, for them, Bill, Bill Dorn was their favorite Astro of all time mm-hmm. and deserving. The guy was awesome. It was just absolutely fantastic. Um, on a down note, it does appear now that Yuli Gurriel may finally be departing mm. the Astros. Reports out there yes. that he's coming uh, close to an agreement with Miami. Miami seems to make some sense to me. Um, it's, you know, it, there's a Cuban connection there, obviously, Miami with a huge Cuban population. Um, he sort of fits what they're doing, and kind of, he fits into their, their lineup. Um, you know, we've, <laughs> we've taken both... Uh, pleasure and grief <laughs> in discussing Yuli because we've talked about mm-hmm. how it just doesn't feel like he fits now, and and we've obviously taken a lot of criticism for that. But at the same time, um, you know, we love Yuli Gurriel, we love Pena. Nobody wants to see the guy go, but I think if he's going to go somewhere, Miami feels like the right move. And on a on a more sort of personal note, you know, for the Astros, we don't have to face him, but you know, once, uh, <laughs> you know, so we won't have to deal with, uh, with him coming back to haunt us. But, uh, yeah, it looks like Yuli, it hasn't been finalized yet, but that's the report is that, uh, going to Miami, probably on a one year deal, I would think. Yeah. You, Yuli's getting up there in years. You know, it took him a while to get out of Cuba and come to the Houston Astros, yeah. but obviously Houston is home for him. And, this is where you know you and I have issues, and it's almost. But we're also regional, so you know we can be, we can be that unbiased or objective, you know, broadcast journalist and say, you know, what this move makes sense because of the numbers, because of yeah. the roster, because of the age, and you start to bring in all these factors. But then on the selfish personal side, you sit there yeah. and go, man. I'm going to be severely disappointed because I know there's a, a, a huge contingent of fans, mm-hmm. but there's a couple that wear the La Pina hats, you yeah. know, the whole pineapple thing, the hair, uh, the championships, the ability to play first base. You know, there's so many great things about Yuli Gurriel still, I believe. But again, baseball is a fickle game. It is. And uh, if there's any diminishing or... Uh, what do they call it? Regression analytics yeah. uh, that aren't in your favor. It's going to be tough to bring you back. And I know that the Astros have Mauricio Dubon, David Hensley, some of these guys that can play up the middle. Mm-hmm. And that increases the opportunity for these guys to be their utility player. Yep. And it's it's time for Yuli to move on, unfortunately. It's yeah. not something I want to see happen. Not me either. Um, but I think I agree with you in the sense that moving to Miami and playing down there makes a whole heck of a lot of sense, not just for Yuli, but for the Miami Marlins. Yeah. This is a guy who who is he is he is he is renowned and revered in Cuba and then you put him into an environment down there in Miami that has a huge Latin contingent watching their games I think yes. it is really smart of them to sign a guy like Yuli Gurriel who's going to fit in nicely He's going to fit in at any clubhouse across the right. league but he's really going to bring something to them too because even though he's on the latter half or, or latter portion of his career, there's still a lot of insight in there. He had to oh, learn yeah. how to play a 162 game season, and then he learned how to become a World Series champion. Yeah. So there's a lot of information that you're going to glean from having a guy like him in your clubhouse. So good for the Miami Marlins. Yeah, I think so too. And and uh, I, I mean, I can't. Uh, how many people in Miami are going to start wearing their back pocket out? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Get that. Turn that blinker on, man. Yeah, Absolutely. That's exactly. That's exactly right. All right. So we did get a question from one of our YouTube viewers that was interesting to me, and I I, I wanted to posit it to you, Blummer. Um, his name is Cisco Leva, and he asked, "Does Christian Javier's value go up some being a strikeout pitcher now that the shift is gone?" And I was it was I thought that was kind of an interesting question because. Um, one of the things that we talked about with the shift is how it's going to increase the likelihood of guys getting on base. And strikeout pitchers are certainly going to be at a, I mean, they're always at a premium. You always want mm-hmm. high strikeout guys. Yeah. But I would think maybe even more so. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, thank you, Cisco, for writing that question in sure. and watching our uh, YouTube channel. But yeah, I think there is going to be a lot more value put on the strikeout pitcher. And I think that Christian Javier's value is going to jump anyways because you lose a guy like Justin Verlander out of the mm. rotation and everybody moves up a spot in that rotation. Mm-hmm. And he'll be that third starter behind Fromber and Lance McCullers. And I do think that his ability to strike guys out is going to to, to increase his value. 
And let's think about it in the context of Justin Verlander in 2022 because he he got off the strikeout. He started to pitch a little bit more to contact yeah, and right. started to get more out, pitched a little bit deeper in games. Now in 2023, the shift being taken away, you're going to find yourself in situations where you're going to have runners at first and third, two outs, and you can't have three guys on the right side of the infield for a big left-handed hitter. So right. you're going to need something that's going to go get that swing and miss. And that's also something that the Astros have really preached and developed in the last six or seven years. Because when it does come to that that clutch moment or that necessary out to get, yeah. they like to go to the swing and miss <clears throat> because that cuts down on the opportunity for the team to get hits or an error or other things going wrong. But Christian Javier, I think, is really continuing to develop and progress in his ability to pitch in the big leagues. And now that he's developed that swing and miss type stuff, it really makes him a better pitcher. Yeah, I think so too. The The value of, I mean, again, the value of strikeout guys is always going to be high. Um, the thing that Javier has done to me that has really sort of changed the dynamic of, and the trajectory of, of his young career is the ability to gain control of his pitches. I mean, that was one of his biggest oh, problems yeah. early on was I saw a great line from a story in The Athletic about a reliever that got traded to uh, – uh, that the, tr- the Twins traded. And they said that he, uh, he can throw a fastball in the triple digits and a, has a, a wicked slider – and doesn't know where either one of them is going most of the time. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, that was uh, early in Christian Javier's career. I mean, it's still very early, but I mean, when he was first in the minors and coming up, that was one of the knocks on him was he mm-hmm. didn't have great control. And he has really seemed to harness that uh, over the last year, year and a half. And that's the, the huge difference. Uh, keeping that ball in the zone. Well, you and I have talked about it plenty of times. It's such a big deal. Yeah, uh, you, you've seen it with Lance McCullers when he first got mm-hmm. called up. Electrifying stuff. He's got the command. He's gotten better. Framber Valdez showed up, walked the planet, but was able yeah. to get out of damage. We called him Houdini because he had bases right. loaded and get out of it every time. But now that his command has gotten better, he's pitching deeper into into ball games, and his right. value has skyrocketed. And then if you're Christian Javier... I, if I'm Christian Javier, I'm sitting there going, man, I got great stuff. My fastball disappears. Yep. I've got a great slider I'm developing. My changeup moves in there every once in a while at great uh, great accuracy and, and mm-hmm. movement. And I'm watching Fromber and Lance McCullers, and I'm going, wow, okay, they're throwing strikes. They've got great stuff. They're getting outs. I want to be that guy. So now you've got this whole development and, and evolution of – Christian Javier, and he continues to get better. But the command on that fastball and realizing that he can throw it in there and get a lot of swings and misses in the zone is a huge confidence boost. Yeah. I kind of also wonder, given the tr- the way these guys have sort of developed year one, year two, I wonder if this year is going to be the year for Luis Garcia to do that. Um, oh, yeah. Good call. <clears throat> you know, that's a guy that is kind of off the radar. Not too many guys, you know, not too many people talking about him. But I feel like he's a guy that could make make a jump. Um, you know, and come up. We all, I mean, I know Hunter Brown, of course, we're all going to like be watching that and being like, but that guy, he's already yeah. seems, I mean, he, his stuff already seems crazy. So, all right, let's talk a little bit about the Hall of Fame announcement coming up today, this, uh, this e- or afternoon, early evening. Um, Billy Wagner on the ballot. Uh, Blum, you and I, I think we're both in 100% alignment here that Billy Wagner deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Um, looks like he will fall just short of the 75% he Unreal. needs, yeah. which is crazy. Um, as uh, you know, this will be the, uh, only one player from the writing side of it. Uh, obviously we mentioned, we talked off the air about Fred McGriff going in as from the veterans committee only could this probably be here. We're only w- we're in three years. Only one guy has gotten in through the writers association. Um, before we dig a little bit more into the Hall of Fame in general, because I have some questions about that, <clears throat> give me your case for Billy Wagner. I mean, it's not a difficult case to lay out, quite frankly. I mean, this is one of the best relievers ever uh, to pick up a baseball. But you know, what? Where? What? I mean, you played with him uh, oh, yeah. for a couple I of seasons. Played against him. Yeah, and you yeah, played I, against him. So, what, what, tell, lay out his case. So. It's, I think John Franco is the only left-hander that has more saves than Billy Wagner. And if you put Billy Wagner and John Franco on the t- on the, on a pitching mound at the same time, I'm going give me John Franco any day of the week. 
because he didn't have the velocity. He had great movement with a right. split finger, but Billy Wagner was intimidating. And Billy Wagner didn't care who was at the plate. He was one of those guys that just went absolutely dark when he was on the mound and said, I'm going to come after you with my 100 mile an hour fastball. I'm going to throw a wrinkle in there every once in a while, but I'm going to challenge the challenge the heck out of you. And I'm going to dare you to hit my stuff. Right. And he was still one of the more successful guys to go out there and do it. Not just as far as, you know, percentage of saves converted, whatever you want to, you know, whatever number you want to put on that. He's got 400 plus saves. Uh, one of the, he was the greatest left-handed save guy for me, even over John Franco. But in this day and age where baseball writers are starting to nitpick, let's go to the peripherals. Let's look, check out some of the other numbers right. to really, you know, quantify what this guy's doing. I've seen so many guys try and fight to get guys into the Hall of Fame. The Larry Walkers, the Tim mm -hmm. Raines. You start to look at some of these. And when I say peripherals, there are other numbers that you need to dig in on. Strikeouts per nine. Nobody gets close to Billy Wagner. Nope. I saw a crazy stat the other day talking about batting average against uh, Billy Wagner. Yeah. He could show up in the big leagues right now, and he could give up 100, 100 straight hits, and his batting average against would be the same as Mariano Rivera's. Unbelievable. Think about that. So he is a sub 200. His strikeouts per nine are off the charts. There are just too many numbers that explain dominance when you talk about Billy Wagner. And because he doesn't have the 500, 600 save number, yeah. big deal. If you compare him to a lot of say, a lot of uh, relievers in the, in the Hall of Fame already, yeah. he is the best. So well, he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. I think it's an easy call for me, and I don't understand why he's not. It's, it, you're exactly right. I was just, I pulled up, I found the numbers here. 422 saves, that's fifth all-time behind Mariano Rivera, Trevor Hoffman, and Lee Smith, ahead of Dennis Eckersley, Raleigh Fingers, Goose Gossage, and Bruce Sutter, obviously from a different era. Uh, Good Lord. His ERA, 231, which is second behind only uh, Rivera. Mm -hmm. Strikeouts per nine, 11.9 strikeouts, which destroys any other... Like, the next guy Completely. is Hoffman, who has, like, two fewer strikeouts per nine. Opponent batting average, 187 opponent batting average. Opponent OPS, 558. <laughs> I mean, my goodness. And the, and this one Dude, is the one. That's slugging that, percentage for some guys. Man. I know, right? <laughs> and this is the one that really kind of stunned me is he is his walks and hits per innings pitched, his whip, 0. 0.997. Second only to Rivera. And just ahead of Dennis Eckersley, who was .998. This is, look, it, we are in an era now where you would think, you would think that from a, from a pitching standpoint, relievers would start to gain greater value. You know, because mm -hmm. we've gone, in, it's, over the last 20 years, the rise of the, the, and I know some people don't like it. Some people would prefer we have, like, guys stretched out and pitching eight, nine innings all the time. But... The fact of the matter is, with the analytics and everything, we realize that the you know we don't want to do that. As as a manager, you want to put your best guys in the best position to succeed. And Wagner was one of the best to ever do it, and it makes zero sense that uh, he should be on the ballot and not get in. It's ridiculous. No, I completely agree, and I know th this is probably going to spiral into you know a little bit more lengthy conversation. But I yeah. think you kind of nailed it with the idea of. You know, and I've talked about this with a lot of other people within the game and even friends and fans of the game, is that the evolution of the Hall of Fame has to adjust. Because you talked about uh, Bruce Souter and, you know, uh, Goose Gossage and some of these guys, even Lee Smith, they played, dur and it, they played during a generation mm -hmm. that was expected to go two, three innings to get their save. The rules were built that way. They, they, they pitched according to that. Yes. But now it's evolved into these you know five, six-man bullpens where you go to the guy in the, in the fifth, sixth inning and you go to your bullpen. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't discount or you know, count that against a guy because he pitched in an era where closers were only supposed to go three outs. That shouldn't be a negative. You should say, okay, this is how this generation played, and you were one of the best. Here you go, get in the Hall of Fame. But I think yeah. there has to be an evolution in the thought process. There has to be an adjustment into, into some of the qualifications to become in the Hall of Fame. And I think they're starting to come around with some of these analytic numbers. But why not for Billy Wagner? I don't understand that. Why are you penalizing him 
instead mm-hmm. of, and, and not somebody else. I don't understand that. There's no reason for it when you look at some of those numbers and how dominant, literally dominant he was for his entire career. Yeah, well, you know, uh, Hall of Fames are weird, right? Um, <laughs> they're just weird, you know, the, and obviously... The Basketball Hall is different because it's the Basketball Hall of Fame, not the Pro Basketball Hall of Fame. So it covers everything from college and European players and, like, you name it. Um, Mm -hmm. But it took, what, 30 years to get Guy V. Lewis into the Basketball Hall of Fame. And that was only because he lost that one game uh, against NC State. I mean, that's really it. That was the whole reason he didn't make it for 30 years. And then you look at the Football Hall of Fame, I'll give them credit. The NFL has done a good job of adjusting its standards, um, realizing that the game is changing, you know, and that the guys that, you know, Dick Butkus and those guys back in the day who used to play, and they were just different creatures than the linebackers mm-hmm. and defensive linemen of today. And, and you know, and like punters are starting to get in because they of the role that they're starting to play. Because the data is saying that they were good. Exactly. And so baseball, it's the most traditional, obviously, of all of these sports. It's the one that clings to its traditions (sighs) to a degree, I think, sometimes is ridiculous. But like with the Hall of Fame, there seems to be like a bizarre level of reverence leveled on it by, by writers. Because they have such a you know, such a sway and all of this stuff. And I kind of wonder, like, at what point do you have to be like, listen, man, you are, I don't care if you have a vote in the Hall of Fame, you may not deserve one. Yeah. You know, it's it's kind of weird. You get these writers in there and they're starting to, you know, some of them are becoming more transparent about their ballots, you know, um, but a lot of them aren't. <clears throat> and a lot of them go in and they, they submit blank ballots, which Dear like God. makes everything yeah. worse. I mean, okay, Blum, I'm going to put you in charge of the Hall of Fame for a moment. Well, my, my dog wants to be. Your dog Jeez. is not uh, cool with that. But you I'm said gonna baseball writers and she snapped. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Um, well done. What's, her, what's that dog's name? Oh, that's Roxy. Yeah, Roxy. she's a, she's a Catahoula leopard dog, and uh, way to go, Roxy. Yeah, uh, yeah, much appreciated. She gets it. That's how she feels about <laughs> Billy Wagner being excluded from the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to put you in charge for a second. What would you do differently? How would you change sort of the dynamic of how? I mean, first of all, it is weird that all, I get the steroid era guys, you know, mm-hmm. and, the, and sort oh, of the yeah. votes against. I get that, but it is weird that we it's so few guys get in. Under, you know, and and oftentimes it's just like, oh, well, that guy played in Colorado for his career. So he doesn't really deserve because, well, you know, uh, he hit only in, in a ballpark where hits go out of, you know, whatever. What would you, how would you approach it? Well, first of all, you've got to cover the game. I'm, I'm tired of seeing some of these writers who are who are now writing for, I don't know, this is just a bad example, but People Magazine, and they haven't covered baseball in 15 years, and they're going, oh, that guy doesn't qualify yeah. because he doesn't have 3,000 hits or 500 home runs or <coughs> you know 300 wins. You know Some of those archaic numbers that are coming in, and uh, you know careers are starting to shorten a little bit for some mm-hmm. of these players, so you have to take them in, you know, take that into account. But you've got to cover the game. I don't care if you're writing for one team. I don't care if you're covering it nationally. You've got to cover the game of baseball so that you can watch these games, witness what they're doing, and really put it into context instead of showing up every winter and going, oh, the my Hall of Fame ballot showed up this week. Hmm, I recognize that name. I don't know who that is. Why would they put him? You know, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear you say, I watched this guy play. He was one of the more dominant players, uh, you know, and and put that guy in. So you, well, that's got to be my main qualification is that you've had to have covered the t- covered something baseball yeah. for at least 10 years because that's how long some of these guys careers are that are getting into the Hall of Fame. And then I would you know, I would just uh, you know, I would you can't put it on a panel, but I think just covering the game would make you a better voter. And you know, I understand it's crazy <clears throat> now that we see some of these votes like you said. There'll be an empty ballot one time and then the next ballot that comes in will have well, it will have uh, Alex Rodriguez and Manny Ramirez voted for. So you're going from this polar extreme over here of not voting for anybody to I'm going to vote everybody and the steroid era in. So do you start to alter the qualifications and say, if you were suspended for anything 
do you qualify for the Hall of, right. Hall of Fame? And I think that that needs to be taken into account because there are guys that are on the ballot who weren't just suspended. They were suspended for seasons. Right. And that should take you off the ballot. I don't care how good you were, but if you were suspended because you failed a drug test, mm -hmm. get off my ballot, make the decision easy for me. But I'd also know that if you sit there and say Todd Helton doesn't belong in because mm -hmm. he played in Colorado his whole career, you're a moron. You're not watching the game. And there's, there's, there's the eye test. There's the splits. The dude raked on the road. Maybe he didn't hit as many home runs, but the dude raked on the road. And then all of a sudden you add the <clears throat> X factor, legit X factor, into some of these analytics, and it evens the playing field, and the guy is still good. Yeah. So it just, it's, it, give me some effort. I think if you put up a blank ballot, you quit. And if you quit by giving me a blank ballot, you can quit and go home and not vote anymore, right. and I'll give it to somebody who respects the game. Well, especially because the blank ballot costs people votes. Yeah. You know, if well, that's, you just, what, that's what knocks Billy Wagner off yeah. the list like you're talking about. If you just don't want to vote, then just don't vote. Don't. But the problem is, it's like the old SAT thing, you know, about like whether you should answer a question. You know, is it mm -hmm. more valuable to have a, a an answered question that is bad or just leave it blank? You can't, and it, 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 they, I, I was watching MLB Network this morning, and they were saying it takes four yes votes to make up for every blank ballot. Holy so, cow. So that's a huge deal, right? Yeah. So, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a mess. I, you know, Blummer, I kind of think, too, one of the real problems with this, and, and I think the NFL, to a certain degree, has it kind of worked out in that they have a board, you know, of people that – are helped yeah. to sort of yep. vet the process. And I kind of wonder if maybe Major League Baseball ought to consider that as well, sort of have a, a filtration process for this thing. They get all the votes in from the writers, and then they sit down and have a conversation. Yeah. Okay, here's the nominees. What do we think? How do we go mm -hmm. through and make our cases for these guys? Yeah, I agree. And I think part of the problem, too, is you know the first ballot Hall of Famers. Maybe these guys yeah. are Hall of Famers eventually, but they think sometimes writers get stuck on the first ballot Hall of Fame. And yeah, that's so weird. I don't want to write them the first ballot. you know. So get get past yourself and some of the arrogance and just you're going to vote for some guys. There's plenty of guys on that ballot. Billy Wagner, Jeff Kent, Gary Sheffield. Mm. You can throw a, a vote out there. I just I, I don't get it. But I like your idea. And I think that's why why baseball has created the Veterans Committee. Because mm -hmm. then you have guys who are in the Hall of Fame and this and this group of people, you know, outside of the writers who say, you know what? In retrospect, this guy was pretty damn good. Right. And we think that he deserves the honor of getting into the Hall of Fame. Because the guys that they have actually voted in, I think Harold Baines was the only guy that really kind of was like, eh, maybe, mm -hmm. but maybe not. But you you know you get Fred McGriff, the mm -hmm. guy, I mean you're gonna go crime up and down dog. and talk. Yeah, the crime dog deserves to be in there. Absolutely, he does. had 493 I think home runs mm -hmm. and had a, an electrifying career, World yes. Series championship. The guy was legit. So the Veterans Com Committee I think for me is kind of that uh, that correction board yes. that just kind of goes, well you kind of got overlooked because these guys for some reason didn't vote you in but we think you deserve to come in so let, let's let's uh, have you join the group i agree with you and and i think sometimes it to me you know like for example um going back to the guy v lewis example um jim valvano who beat guy v lewis in that game uh mm -hmm. in the pit in albuquerque um you know he was not he had no business being a hall of fame coach right um, mm -hmm. his win totals didn't stack up. He did win the one championship on the, you know, on that fluky last second play, but he was in way before guy Lewis. And there were guys like John Chaney from temple who were way in, but you know why a lot of those guys were in is because they were well recognized, well-known names. They got yeah. into media. They start, you know, people saw them all the time. There was a recognition of who they were and guy Lewis, you know, he left, you know, basketball behind um, and so there was this idea that, well, he was this, you know, never mind all the other things he brought. I see that in, in all sports, you know, Harold Baines is a good example. Great commentator, right? Great guy that covers great coach, great everything. Yeah, yeah. Tremendous, tremendous. So his name is out there, but what if Fred yeah. McGriff, nobody, you know, talks about Fred McGriff, the, you know, because well, Fred McGriff isn't a name that people are going to just sit around and talk about. Mm-hmm. 
And that holds guys like that back. And that's why I think, and I mean, look, we're human. It's it's in our nature, oh, I think, yeah. to kind of have those things. But if you're a, if you're a voting for the Hall of Fame, you need to be better than that. You've yeah. got to be better than that. You know, I, this is totally off topic. Really, Tom Don, Tom Jonovich. <sighs> What the hell took so long with that one? Another good one. Rudy Damn, T. Dude. Yeah, Rudy T. He, one of the things that he suffered from, and I, th- again, this is this is hashtag Houston sports kind of stuff. Yeah, enlighten now, me. Right? Because, you know, I, you know I, I watched him from afar when I was, you know, when I was in yeah. L.A. And I'm going, dude, the Houston Rockets, Rudy Tomjanovich. I mean, that guy was a championship coach. I move here. Yeah. Find out that he's a phenomenal human being. And oh, people yeah. love him Great even guy. more in the community. And I'm going... He just got into the Hall of Fame. Like it shocked me when he got announced. I was like, "How has this guy not been in there?" Well, it's it's even weirder because you know the Basketball Hall of Fame is the Basketball Hall of Fame. It covers your college career, your pro career, <laughs> right? and he was he was an All American at Michigan. You know, uh, Truly. he was he was an All Star uh, with the Rockets. Career. I think a lot of what happened with Rudy T is a combination of two things, and that we're really getting out of here, but I'll, I'll do it anyway because <laughs> hell with it. One, it's the offseason. That's right. One uh, was the punch, right? Yeah. Um, when he was punched by Kermit Washington, almost died. And by the way, Kermit Washington did not deserve the harshness that was levied upon him either. It was just a moment in the game. It did change basketball. It did change uh, the way the sport was played. That it, it really tamped down on the violence. But I think Rudy was kind of the... It, it ended his career essentially, yeah. and it was it was cut, it cut short his career. And it I think that's what people kind of remembered him for. At that point, was that which John Feinstein wrote a great book called The Punch. It's all about it, and it covers all the way up to like sort of what happened afterwards. Just absolutely fantastic. Um, the second thing I think is that he was the winning coach in the Michael Jordan era when Michael Jordan wasn't playing basketball, and I think that there is. People still put an asterisk by the Rockets back-to-back titles because Michael Jordan was away playing baseball. Now, Dear God, he one w- guy? Right. He was not away playing baseball the second year. He was back. But everybody's like, oh, he wasn't Michael Jordan. And yes, they did come back and win three more titles. The Bulls were incredible. Um, mm-hmm. But there is, a, there is the narrative in pro sports that is attached to certain guys and to certain teams. There's a magic and a mystique that comes with that. And Rudy T was not one of those guys. He was, I, honestly, the most impressive thing maybe Rudy T ever did was when he helped Team USA qualify with a bunch of, like, teenagers, right? Yeah. He, you True. know, and I, before, you know, after the, before the Redeem team, after the Dream team. Um, but so, yeah, it took a long time, and it took a lot of pushing from uh, Hall of Famers to get him in there. And these are the kind of things that make me crazy about Hall of Fame. It's like, because there is a narrative out there about guys, and and it brings me to my next point, which I'm really kind of glad we went down this track, and that mm-hmm. is, how is this going to affect Ast- the current Astros because oh. of the sign stealing? How is this going to affect Jose Altuve with the fact that some idiot on the internet tried to say that he was wearing a buzzer. Like, what is this going to do to these guys? You know, now, granted, there's been some indication that maybe some of these guys are going to, you know, Carlos Beltran got more votes uh, for the Hall of Fame than, than the PED guys did. But I can't help but wonder if this isn't going to tarnish some of these guys, especially because I think a lot of people thought they should have been punished more harshly, and they weren't. That that's going to be that that's going to obviously remain to be seen, and it is a little frightening because that was actually one of my first thoughts. Because having played through the steroid era, mm-hmm. recognizing how great some of those guys were, but then they had that they had that cloud looming over them. Were they PED guys? And, right. And, and Carlos Beltran is going to be a good barometer because yeah. you know, according to Rob Manfred. He was the godfather of this whole thing. Yes. You know, he showed up from the New York Yankees and said, "Oh, you guys, you guys aren't even doing it right because of the way they were doing it in New York when Carlos Beltran was there." Which should end all conversations, right? Which should end all <sighs> How does it because not? if they were doing it in New York, that should literally end every conversation about this ever, but it of course it doesn't. No. No, <laughs> it doesn't because the 
because why would we look at facts? But <laughs> um, but he shows up and then he right. gets re- he's the only player that was reported in that report, which kind yeah. of pissed me off to be honest with you because it went against what Rob Manfred said he was going to do. So that's just that's another reason, you know. Yeah, well, Rob Manfred. But oof. Uh, but Carlos Beltran <clears throat> had a Hall of Fame career and later in his career couldn't catch up to the fastball found a way to try and compete with that. Mm -hmm. But if he's starting to get more votes, I think if you give him the recognition and get him Hall of Fame votes, you can't, you can't penalize other guys Mm -hmm. because those other guys wouldn't have been affected by the sign stealing scandal. If it were, if if Carlos Beltran wasn't on that team, right? You know, that's my, that, that's what you have to take into account. Yeah. And you know, with the Astros, there are going to be a lot of guys from this era who are going to have some pretty, uh, skewed numbers. Um, because they were in the playoffs often. I mean, you got a bunch of guys oh. with most home runs in playoff history, most RBIs in playoff history. There are going to be a lot of records that are going to be owned by this era, uh, at least a lot of playoff records that are going to be owned by this era 100%. of Astros. I think the guy, like, you know, look at, you know, it, it's obviously not going to go in as pitchers as much. Justin Verlander's going to get in, and nobody's going to question it. Um, but I do think it's going to be real interesting to watch because these are going to be guys... Certainly Jose Altuve, right? Yeah. We can we can just sort of check the box on him. Yeah, but, he's projected to be in that vote to go in. Absolutely. Yeah. But you look at it and you're like, because uh, here's the thing for me. Uh, I don't, whatever the, the sign stealing thing and all that was, as, as somebody on MLB Network described as it, it makes the whole situation murky because so many teams were doing it. And it was so <laughs> widespread, no matter what baseball one would like you to believe. But <clears throat> when you look at a guy like Altuve, Altuve's been hit particularly hard by these, you know, sign stealing scandal allegations, despite probably being one of the guys who absolutely didn't do it. You know what I mean? There's data to prove <clears throat> it. Yeah, and I mean, this guy, he's the out of all of them, he's the one guy that's like, hell no, I don't want any part of this, you know, mm-hmm. nonsense. And then but then I like and it's ter- and again we're this is a ugh, I hate even this conversation, but I hate um, it too. whenever I talk to people from other places and they're like, well, yeah, he wore a buzzer. Like, listen, man, what the f- exactly, exactly, Blummer, what the f- <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna put an explicit language on this one because f- it, this is ridiculous. Dude, this is the buzzer is, thing is stupid. It's and it's stupid. all because of some idiot on the internet. Like I. I've told you before, I don't like conspiracy theories. They make me nuts because they're based on no evidence, no data, just on somebody's random idea about what's happening. And this is something that could help keep him from getting into the Hall of Fame in a timely fashion. This is the kind of reason why I think we need vetting. This is the reason yeah. because because these are the kind of things that sway writers. That they, they shouldn't sway writers because writers should be smarter <laughs> than that. And we can, again, we can ask that. We're... Um, we'll have Brian McTaggart on here in a couple of weeks. We should ask him for sure about mm-hmm. that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's it's infuriating to think about that. But again, I think that's why, as you said, the Hall of Fame needs to adapt. It needs to change. And there need to be some serious thought put into who exactly is voting. Nobody thinks, of, for example, nobody thinks that NBA All-Star appearances are important anymore. Why? Because all of the people who get on the starting teams are voted by the fans online mm-hmm. on the internet, and the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of they get a lot of it right. You know, I mean, they're still voting yeah. for great players, but the truth of the matter is, is that because it's a fan vote, it can't really count as much. Um, because you know, we I love the popularity. Fans, but, yeah. yeah, it's popularity. It's a popularity contest. Somebody, the adults have got to be in charge somewhere. <laughs> I mean, especially you some, in the, uh, you got some wishful thoughts, man. Especially in the Hall of Fame, you got to put some adults in charge, man. <clears throat> yep, I agree. I mean, hell, we can barely get adults in charge of anything in this world. But like, it would be nice <laughs> if the Hall of Fame could have a little, a few people. I'm, well, I'm if they're like, adult, they're they're about forty years past their adulthood. <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah, that is a good question. <laughs> like, should there be an expiration date on your? <laughs> Time frame. I mean, come on. Yeah, like everybody's. Do they get term limits for Hall of Fame voters? <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. Oh man. The, the regre- gonna... regression analytics in the sport. How about in the in the in the writing and the balloting? Right. So, dear baseball writers who may decide to come on this show at some point, we still love you. 
please vote correctly. Don't screw up. Vote for <laughs> Billy Wagner. Be smart. I mean, it's just simple, right? I mean, yeah. and by the way, <clears throat> you mentioned Todd Helton. I mean, come on. Like, <laughs> anybody who watched that guy knows that that guy is absolute. I mean, okay, maybe he's a little bit borderline on you say, okay, one of the best, you know, guys ever to play. Okay, you can ar- make arguments on, yes. you know. But I don't think you can make an argument about whether or not that guy should be in the Hall of Fame. That's not really a good argument. If you're making yeah, that argument, it's a bad be, argument. Yeah. yeah, you can't. It, it, don't give me that Colorado stuff because that dude, you still got to find a way to get the barrel to the uh, yes. ball and get hits. <laughs> and that that dude, I played against him for, a, for three years straight when I was with San Diego. And I mean, I'd be all happy-go-lucky. That dude would come to the plate. My shoulders would drop down to my waist. And I'd be like, damn it, where's this guy going to hit this ball this time? And whack! Two runs in. I'm like, dude, this son of a... That's yeah, the thing. He, he was really good. You still have to hit. Like, people are always mm-hmm. like, well, they hit in Colorado. Yeah, but you still have to That's hit like the damn ball. That's like saying Joey Gallo's going to have a higher bat or, or be a better <laughs> hitter because the shift is banned. No, he's not. not. He may get a couple more hits, right. but he's not going to be a better contact hitter. He's not going to suddenly hit the ball all the time. He's not going to suddenly <laughs> get the... It's like, you still actually have to make contact. It's physics. And Todd Hilton did a lot of that. Yeah, exactly. All right, we've I think we've ranted on this one enough, <laughs> Plumber. We're gonna get yep. we're gonna get ourselves in trouble, uh, but it should it makes for compelling. Wusfraba. Exactly. It's like what was it? Wusau. Wusa. I'm yeah. like anything to sort of, but I, the truth is is that these are honestly it's an important topic. We should be talking about this. I agree. And not just because mm-hmm. of Billy Wagner. We should be talking about it because it it is important. The Hall of Fame is important. Um, and you've been in the baseball long enough. To understand, that, I mean, you've seen a lot, a lot of Hall of Famers in your time, and you know the impact they have. And it's important. It needs to be it needs to be carefully it's, considered. It, and you know what? It's also important. We keep talking about generations. It's also important to 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 continue the legacy of baseball because <clears throat> yes. our generation witnessed greatness. This next generation is going to witness it. And how do you get people to stay enthralled with the game? And I, yeah. I watch this a lot with the Houston Astros. There is a group of people who love the 80s. There's a group of people who love the 90s. And you continue to give that love yep. to your your kids and your generation and after that. And that's why you keep going to the Hall of Fame. Because you go in and you go, I remember Mickey Mantle. I remember Greg Maddox. And I'm also going to remember Jose Altuve or the Todd Heltons and some of these guys and the Billy Wagners and say, man, you know what? I, I know why he's in here. Because I watched him and he was great. But the generational aspect of it is huge just for the yeah. legacy of the game itself and that's why you need to respect these guys and adjust because they are worthy of being in there because they're worthy of continuing the love for the game Blummer, that is so well said i couldn't have said it better myself and i think we'll leave it on that because what else is there to be said um we will be back uh later this week uh We'll find out whether Billy Wagner got in or didn't, the, obviously, this afternoon. Be paying close attention to that. You, I think you can watch it on MLB.com. You can watch the actual ceremony. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and we will be back again on Friday with a fresh pod brought to you by Bet Online. Again, a huge thanks to all our listeners, viewers across the world. You guys are the absolute best. Um, you doing? Keep liking and subscribing. Keep commenting. Obviously, I love the comments because they they bring in interesting, great questions, interesting stuff. Very deeply thankful for all of you guys. So keep it rolling. Just 66 days to opening day. Uh, So anyway, thanks, guys. We'll talk to you soon. Go Astros.